Welcome to the presentations around uh, Identity Server and integrating into your current application. Uh, and it's going to be obviously a bit about OAuth 2, given that it's um, uh, primarily what it supports. Uh, I've got a fair bit to cover, so I'm going to sort of crack through it fairly quickly. I'll try to remain as coherent as possible, uh, but there is a fair bit to get through, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll try and remain slow but fast. Uh, some of the things that we will cover, um, generally what identity server is uh, and why you'd even bother using it. Can I get a show of hands as to uh, who's used identity server? So few. Um, and hands, uh, as far as, I guess, implicitly you'd be familiar with OAuth, but does everybody know what OAuth 2 is and some of the, the flows? Okay, that's pretty good. So we're going to cover uh, just generally what identity server is, how, you know, why you'd bother. We'll be fairly brief there. Um, and obviously how to integrate it into your uh, application. Because uh, it's a fairly big product, it's a fairly um, uh, robust product, um, but it, it can be quite tricky to, to start integrating into your app, uh, particularly if you've just got no idea, you just sort of install a new get package and you're, you're hoping for the best. Um, like all things, there's usually uh, tricks and traps to it, so that's what we're going to cover here. We'll have a look at all the extension points and all the various ways that you can configure and customise it. Um, and obviously, um, Probably the most important bit is what was hard, you know, some of the pain points and some of the things that might uh, trip you up. What we won't go into is a you know, detailed explanation of OAuth 2 and all the flows that are involved and how all that kind of works. That's really beyond the scope of this talk and you could be here for like a month talking about that stuff. And to be quite frank, I don't know it uh, all. I know enough. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in it. Um, and I won't show you every possible integration scenario, but you will get a good feel about how to integrate it, what you need to do, and how you can sort of fit it into your apps. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll have a sort of good uh, technical cost uh, as to what may involve. It may you know, influence your decision of whether you use identity server or whether you use something else or how you use it. Uh, so just briefly, uh, my name is Paul Glavich. Um, you can see my uh, email up there if you need to contact me, uh, asp.net, MVP. Uh, I've written a few books. I'm an international speaker, if you count speaking in New Zealand. Some would, uh, some would uh, yeah, not say that's international. However, uh, CTR of sasu.com at the moment and uh, ASP Insider. On to the next bit. What is Identity Server? Um, you know, the name kind of gives it away. It is uh, a fully spec compliant OAuth 2 um, security token system. Um, it has been written by some security uh, experts, uh, Dominic Bayer and Brock Allen. And these guys are fairly prominent in the security scene. They know a lot more about security than most of us will probably ever know. Um, so you're resting on the shoulders of giants in terms of if you were to utilize this in, in your application. Um, it caters for every OAuth 2 flow and probably, uh, that you could possibly need. Um, certainly all the ones that are in the spec. Uh, discovery, document discovery, uh, it, it's got everything in there. Open ID, connect. Um, so it's got everything you need in there and it's, it's it's nice and easy. It's an open source product. You install it as a NuGet package. Uh, it's quite modular, uh, so it's very easy to use. Um, and again, it's been out in the wild for quite some time, so it's had um, good tests within the industry. Um, so you can be fairly certain that it is uh, a good product. And as you go, if you were to do research on it, you can see that a lot of people are using it. Uh, they're very responsive to issues around it. Uh, the one I'll be talking about today is Identity Server 3. Um, which is currently the latest incarnation of it. They are working on Identity Server 4 with support for .NET uh, Core. Um, but given that it's so much uh, in flux at the moment, it's not something I'm going to be touching today because, you know, that I can't be like stabbing myself in the eye with a, with a fork. I think it'd just be a bit too risky. So I'm going with Identity Server 3 and that's really um, where I've got most of the experience. I think Identity Server 4 is yet to be released. They're still working on it. I think it's in beta. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but Identity Server, it's, just, it's currently just a set of NuGet packages, or it's one to start with, and you can build on that by installing other NuGet packages, and we'll have a look at that a bit later. It's Owen based um, so it's very familiar territory if you have used .NET Core or uh, any sort of uh, Owen based implementation, so it's, quite, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, there are other things that I'll touch on briefly that uh, you can use with it. Uh, for those familiar with the old website administration tool, Identity Manager is something you can, again, it's open source, you can download and that helps you administer Identity Server itself. Now, I haven't really used that myself, but um, it's certainly available it's just to make things easier for developers. And there's the Identity Model, uh, which is kind of the client-side libraries and helper classes and, and everything. Those aren't necessary to use Identity Server, they just help you out a bit easier. So, why bother? 
Um, you can develop your own. And in fact, uh, just as part of the context, when we started, uh, when I started looking at using some sort of OAuth 2 flow, this was many, many years ago, um, when, if you guys remember, um, Web API was actually WCF Web API. So we started to implement it then. So that was quite way back. I wouldn't, I'm not sure if identity server was available then, uh, but we certainly wanted to use OAuth 2. And back in the day, we actually did uh, write our own simple flow for, uh, around a resource owner uh, authorization flow, which is essentially just a kind of a username password flow. Um, and over time, we thought, all right, now we need to support authorization code flow, which is really the more secure uh, mechanism of OAuth 2 and probably the more popular of flows in terms of OAuth 2. Um, but it is uh, a lot more work to implement and just sort of looking at it, thinking, oh my God, there's a lot of all these um, avenues to look at. There's a lot of security concerns. I'm really, I really don't want to start down this path, given there's all these other um, providers that you can use. So yes, we did actually start to write our own, but it, it's, um, I certainly wouldn't advocate it. However, you know, you can, but it, it, it quite often ends in, uh, ends in tears. But, you know, if you're keen, go for it. However, like I said, uh, Dominic Baer, Brock Allen, they are security experts, best to rely on those guys. There are alternatives out there, uh, Auth0 being one, uh, Azure Active Directory, uh, WSA2 is another. I haven't used, I certainly haven't used WSO2 and I'm certainly, I've played with uh, Auth0 and Azure Active Directory. They're all very capable products. Um, they are cloud hosted, oh sorry, WSO2 is, is one that isn't cloud hosted, it's also open source, but it's Java based. So you take on a bit of a dependency if you're a .NET person. Uh, the other two are cloud based, so you know, you're sort of relegating your infrastructure elsewhere. It's certainly viable approaches, so I'm not advocating one or the other. Uh, I certainly would do due diligence on which is the best approach for, for you if you were to deciding on what to do. Um, but there they are alternatives out there. So, getting started. Um, at the end of the day, just to, to get Identity Server in there, all you really need to do is install NuGet package, Identity Server 3, configure some startup, uh, and you're good to go. And that's what we'll do now. Okay, so I've got a... Everybody see that okay? Is that uh, large enough? Yeah? All right, good. Awesome. All right, so I've already installed the NuGet package into this app. This is just a standard ASP.NET MVC app. Um, if we go have a look down here in Startup. Oh, in there. So coming in the configuration section, I've just got app, use identity service simple startup. And in here, let's get rid of that. Uh, this is where I'm, I'm setting some startup uh, options. Um, yeah, actually, I'll go through this before I, I run it up for you. So all I'm doing, it's fairly simple. I'm setting up logging here. Um, so I've got log provider, set current log provider. A simple diagnostic logger, it's just writing to a file. It's nothing special apart from implementing a log provider. So I won't go into that in too much detail. What I will say, and I'll reiterate it over, a, uh, over the course of this presentation, is that before you do anything with Identity Server, is make sure logging is working. Uh, because without it, you're just going to be... Um, it's going to be a lot of pain to try and figure out what's going wrong. So you start using, say, an authorization code flow, and it'll just go, um, you know, not authorized or something's not working. Without logging working, um, you'll spend hours trying to debug it. So if anything, if there's one thing you take away from this, get logging going. Okay, so here we're going uh, mapping a path for identity, service to, identity server to use, and we're calling it identity. So when we spin up the site, we go to the identity route, and that's where identity server will be. Setting a few simple options, site name, in, instant, in this instance we're not requiring SSL, an issue URI, which is important for uh, validation of tokens when they come in, and a signing certificate. And in this instance, I'm just loading uh, a file off the file system. It's just a test certificate. Uh, and I, I mean, it's fairly simple. It's not really obviously a production ready scenario, but what you want to do when using identity server, particularly for the first time, is just getting, getting it working without really integrating it, just making sure it's up and running and the cogs are turning. Uh, turning on all the logging options. Oh, oh man. Uh, and then I'm setting up uh, the factory that Identity Server is going to rely on to get going. I'm setting up some clients, users, and scopes. And just for a clarification, uh, users uh, in Identity Server world are human users, so there's something, someone who will log into the system. The clients are the machine users of the system. So they'll be, say, the applications that your users may register uh, for Identity Server to uh, validate. 
And a scope is kind of like a, um, a sort of a category of security. It could be read, it could be offline access, it could be customer API. There's some standard scopes and you can customize the set of scopes as well. And they, they're a way for you to categorize how you're going to access um, your either API or your resources or whatever. In, in this instance, um, I'm setting up some in-memory options and uh, Identity Server has some in-memory um, support so you can get going really quick. So let's have a look at the users, for example. And I'm just setting up a, a static list of users. I've got Mary, the password's password. Mort, password, password. Um, and this subject, one, two, three. Um, so that subject is usually a unique identifier, usually a user ID, for example. And I'm setting up a series of claims. Again, nothing spectacular. Normally you'd store this in the database, but again, to get Identity Server up and running, let's just use the in-memory representations first up to make sure that it is actually working. Uh, clients, similar here, setting up an in-memory list. I've got client name, client ID. I'm setting a secret, not so secret, but. Uh, and, then, and then for the client, I'm setting up a resource owner OAuth2 flow. Uh, these are the allowed scopes for that client. So this client, again, is going to be the application that's registered that Identity Server would be validating against when your user is allowing or disallowing um, access. The access token type, in this case, is JWT, which is a JavaScript web token. You can use a reference token, and we'll have a look at that a bit more a bit later on. And the refresh token usage is reuse. So we're going to reuse the refresh token. I'm just setting up some more clients here. One's got an authorization code flow. And there's another client down there that will be using a reference token in the authorization code flow. So again, just setting up some in-memory stuff. Lastly, uh, the scopes. More in-memory. We've got some standard ones that Identity Server provides. And you can define your custom scopes as well. So, you know, we're just pretty much hard coding stuff to see if it works. So I'll spin this up. Up. Are there options to not store the passwords in plain text? Oh, absolutely, yes, and that's far from recommended. This is just, um, <laughs> it's just we're just hard coding stuff in here so that you can actually make sure that identity server is working and there's a flow going. And then we'll start to build on that. So we've got our ASP.NET MVC side up. If you remember, we had the app map identity path. So we should be able to go there. Okay, so we know that identity server is actually working. This is the welcome page that we had enabled first up. And this is what comes out of the box with identity server. It gets packaged with a whole bunch of assets um, that you can use to make sure that everything's working. If we click on here, we've got a discovery document. So this is uh, just a JSON. I mean, pretty ugly, but um, uh, it's just uh, a JSON blob that shows you, uh, that describes all the endpoints that can be used for dynamic discovery. So Identity Server gives you that out of the box. If we click on application permissions, it wants us to log in because we don't know who the user is. And if you remember from the um, users that we had hard coded, we had Mary, password is password. Okay, we haven't given any permissions. We want Mary to log out. So this logout page, the login page, and all that kind of stuff is all embedded within Identity Server. And because this has come up OK, we know that um, Identity Server is actually working fine. So we can say, all right, I'm pretty confident that I've installed the package fine. You know, it's all working. So we can now start to, to build on that. Uh, I did mention um, uh, before that logging, uh, again, is very important. Please get that working first up. Uh, but it does, you don't have to just do a, you know, log to a text file using your custom logger. It supports uh, Serilog, um, Log4Net, uh, Nlog, uh, and a few others. And you can, you can build your own, so it's quite flexible that way. With something like Serilog, it's just a matter of installing the requisite package, and there's a small configuration section to use. Same with all the others as well. Uh, it's quite easy. Um, so before we get further into customizing uh, Identity Server, we've kind of installed the package. It's, we know it's working. Now it's actually time to start integrating it actually into our application. We've got our Identity Server endpoints, which we, um, oh, sorry, before what I did forget. Um, just to verify that it is actually going.
once that's up and running. Uh, are you guys familiar with, uh, with Postman, the Chrome tool that does API, you can use it to, uh, to uh, access APIs, um, which is what I'm using here. Um, again, so I've started up Identity Server, we know it's actually running. I'm going to um, run that resource owner uh, flow that we mentioned, in, that we defined as the first client, client ID 1. Um, just to verify that we are actually getting some form of OAuth 2 flow going. So I'm accessing URL at identity, uh, connect slash token. In the headers, I've got an authorization header uh, with basic and a little base64 blob. And what that is is a client ID, colon, and the client secret. So in this case, it's uh, client ID 1, colon, secret, which we saw um, defined for that um, uh, for that client, or oh, sorry, for the, at, um, yeah, sorry, that client. And that's in the authorization area, so that's how we actually authenticate. But if we have a look at the body, we're looking for a grant type of password. The username is Mary, password's password, and the scope is offline access. So we're actually going to invoke the resource owner flow. I hit send, and if we have a look down here, come back to me. You can see the access token. Uh, it's fairly, a it's fairly big blob. Uh, that's your JavaScript web token there. And you can take, go and take that token, copy it into a site like jwt.io, and it'll give you uh, a breakdown of what's involved in the token, the issuer, some claims, audience, subject, those kinds of things. Um, we did mention briefly in some of the um, uh, client definitions, there's a JavaScript web token and a reference token. If you have a look down here, oh, it doesn't even not going lower. All right. So that token there, hopefully you can. That's a reference token. The access token above it is a big blob, which is a JavaScript web token. The difference is the JavaScript web token can be introspected locally. Um, so you don't need to call into identity server to say, hey, what's, what claims are in this token? When does it expire? Those kinds of things. The JavaScript web token holds all that. It's got a signing uh, key, uh, a signing hash against it, which is provided by the certificate. So for example, a mobile application, you may not want to hit identity server all the time to validate your token. The JavaScript web token is a good candidate for that. The reference token down the bottom holds no information. It's just a blob of string. You've got to go to um, identity server to ask for the claims and any contextual information around that. The reference token is probably a bit more secure, but if you don't want to hit, do all those round trips, a, a, a JavaScript web token is a good choice as well. So we've just, um, um, we've just done a resource owner flow. We've got an access token and a refresh token. If I change that to a read scope, hit send. The difference here is we don't get a refresh token. In order for identity server to give you a refresh token, and for those who don't know the flow, if you were to get an access token, for example, you use that in your API calls and you're good to go for, let's say, three hours, that access token will expire. You need to use the refresh token to request another access token. If you don't use the offline access scope, identity server won't give you a refresh token to refresh your access token. You'll have to go through the whole resource flow again. So again, in the case of, let's say, a mobile application, you don't want to keep going through that um, reauthentication flow. You'd hold on to this refresh token, which is long-lived, and you can do all that behind the scenes and keep getting a new access token all the time. So if I do that again, with offline access as escape, you can see I've got the refresh token here. I copy that into here, and I'm accessing connect token again. But this time, the grant type is refresh token, and I hit send. Uh, it's just going to keep on giving me a new access token all the time. So that's with our in-memory hard-coded uh, identity server. We know that the resource um, owner flow is working well, so we're pretty confident that things are, are good to go. For the reason you're getting the offline token, uh, offline token is it because it's the authorization code flow? So uh, no, the reason I was getting the, you mean the refresh token there? Okay. is because I was requesting a, spo a scope of offline access. Right. That's, the, that's the only reason there. That's the default behavior? Yes, well, that's identity server's default behavior, and I believe that's part of the spec. You can request multiple scopes, so it could be offline access, and then read, and then open ID, and then my custom scope. So it can have multiple scopes in there, but in order for you to get a refresh token, you must include offline access. Okay, so we know that everything's working from a very um, basic perspective, so we want to start uh, customizing it. Uh, so we've got our identity server endpoints. The things that we can um, customize, you can see in the gray there, but essentially it's pretty simple. Identity server has a set of services. Those services call down to a store to access the data store. 
Those services also request certain assets, and that might be the login page, logout page, uh, all those kinds of things uh, that you saw. So when I logged in, it said, do you want to um, log out? These are all embedded in Identity Server. So the application services request those assets, utilizes the stores if it wants to store tokens and retrieve tokens, uh, and we can customize all that. Uh, it has external integration with things like Google and Facebook, and obviously you can't really change those, but you can configure it to use it in specific ways. We're not going to look, be looking at those aspects, we're going to be looking at pretty much the grey boxes here. So how to configure application services, your stores, and your assets. Uh, and in terms of assets, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty flexible. By default, um, as I said, uh, Identity Server embeds, them, embeds its own assets within there, but obviously you don't want to use those. Uh, if you were to provide a templates directory on your site, it will attempt to go and look there for things like the HTML view, views, CSS files, scripts. Um, if it finds those there, it will attempt to load them. Um, there is a default view service that uh, Identity Server implements. You can configure the default view service to look in a different area, which is what we'll do in the, in the next demo, to look for these HTML files. Alternatively, you can uh, provide your own implementation of the default view service, and you can load those kinds of assets uh, from anywhere you like. So let's have a look at that. Okay. So, like most things with Identity Server, it's all about the configuration. So this is the same configuration as before with a few minor changes. Um, we're setting up our Identity Server options, you know, we're doing the app map, we're setting the logging in the factory that's still using in memory at this point. But this time we're going to create a new default view service options instance. We're going to say, all right, from the content identity server uh, directory, I want to load in this uh, custom identity server style, style sheet. Uh, in addition, instead of loading it from uh, templates, uh, I want, or loading the assets from templates, I want you to load it from the content identity server directory. We just have a quick look at that. Uh, oh, there we go. Content identity server. And you can see we've got a whole bunch of uh, HTML partial views in there. I've got a script file. There's the CSS file, um, which is nothing spectacular. Um, and I've just got my own uh, custom error, custom layout, I've got the custom login, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Uh, and that's the standard HTML. Uh, Identity Server behind these scenes uses, uh, uses Angular. And I've, what I've kind of done is just taken a bit of a, a copy and just changed the names of the Innocent. Um, so if you go to where I, the site that hosts uh, Identity Server source code, you can see all these views which you can take, copy, modify, which is essentially what I've done here. So I go back here. Oh, sorry, bear with me one second. So coming back down here, I've really only um, done a few things here. Again, default view service options, set a style sheet to add in, and a custom view directory for where to load those uh, HTML assets. Uh, in addition, I've set this cache views to false. Um, by default, it's, uh, it's true, uh, and what that means is uh, Identity Server obviously will cache the views. So if you're in development and you're doing changes uh, and they're not coming through, you know, obviously you want to see it come through as quickly as possible, so turn cache views off. So in this case, just saying, look, if you're in debug mode, then cache views are, uh, are off, but just something handy. And ID app, use Identity Server with these options and you're good to go. So let's try that. So remember, we're still using the in-memory um, clients and users, so nothing spectacular there. But this is the first stage in, in customizing it, which is just probably making it look like your application. So we call up identity. And you see that nothing's really changed from the welcome page there. And unfortunately, you can't change the welcome page. Apparently, that welcome page uh, was introduced late in the scheme after they implemented the default uh, view service, and it wasn't part of that flow. So you can turn the that welcome page on or off, but you can't really customize it. It's all the other things that you can customize. So if I go to application permissions again, and you can see the superb styling that I've uh, included here. So I'm calling Mary and password. 
And you know, it's the same flow. I'm just using my own HTML and my own styles, which are clearly superior in every way. So that's pretty easy. Um, and while, so the configuration to get that going is quite simple. Obviously, it's going to take you some time to customize the HTML how you want it. Now, if you completely use your own HTML, obviously, you have to try and figure out, uh, you know, make the right calls back to Identity Server that mimics the way that it does it. Um, but for the most part, um, for what I've done here and what we've done in our own application uh, is we've customized the HTML, but we, we leave all the Angular stuff in and we let, HT, uh, we let, um, let it work with Identity Server because it's kind of the path of, path of least resistance and the HTML is easy enough to customize anyway. So that was just a custom, that was just HTML assets. Pretty easy, again, to configure. Um, and, um, you know, that's probably your first port of call. But obviously you want to get down there and you want to um, integrate it to your data store because that's where everything's going to be stored. Uh, and that's really where the, the, the meat of the work comes in. Uh, it does support an Entity Framework 6 NuGet package. So you can install that package. And there's just a small bit of configuration for you to use. Um, but obviously that's not much fun. It's pretty boring in terms of demo. So I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to be uh, uh, using Dapper. Has everybody, well, has anybody heard of Dapper? Show of hands. Okay, awesome. Um, I haven't actually uh, done a lot with Dapper, but I thought it would be fun to learn. You know, that resume-driven development that, um, that Udi talked about, so I can add that little tick as well. Um, but everything in, uh, in terms of the day store and uh, heaps of stuff, well, almost everything in Identity Server is customizable. But the whole storage engine, those application services that you saw in that diagram before, you can um, use Identity Server's version and just um, implement a few stores. You can implement all the stores and all the services. It's really up to you. There are a few um, mandatory ones like the client, scopes, and user uh, that you really need to uh, implement. And then you can go and implement the others if you choose. And really, if you're going to do a custom version of those, you'll probably go and do everything else anyway. So on to the demo about how you go and do that. And I will show you another OAuth 2 flow, I promise. So let's go here. And let's quickly have a look in here. So again, much the same here. I have changed a few things. Uh, instead of loading a certificate from the file system, um, in debug mode I still do that, but there's also some code here to actually load it from the certificate store, which is what you typically do in production. And this code will all be on, uh, on GitHub, uh, so you can have a look at it later on. We've got our view options, which we still customise. We're actually adding a few other bits. Um, so cross-origin request policy, um, we're allowing everything in this case. I thought I'd throw that in there just, just for the hell of it. Um, you know, enabling the welcome page conditionally if it's in debug. We're not caching the views. If we were to use the Entity Framework Data Persistence Mechanism, this is all you'd really need to do, is set a connection string and the schema, provided you install the requisite NuGet package. Um, so it's pretty easy. You know, install a NuGet package, run it up, create your schema for you, and away you go. But we won't be doing that. Instead, we're going to set up a whole bunch of uh, custom implementation hooks. So against the factory that we uh, created up before, uh, I'm going to uh, do a new registration of my Dapper repository, a new registration of my particular membership service. Now, they're my own custom ones. They've got nothing specific to do with, um, uh, with Identity Server. They're just to register into the DI system so that when my custom services requires one of those, it'll know what to do. If you have a look here, we've got our user service, client store, authorization code store, consent store, the stores, um, with the exception of uh, one service here, which is the user service. So again, we're doing a new registration. In the case of the user service, it's the iUser service, and I've got my custom identity user service. And it's the same for the client store, authorization store. We're just going against the interfaces and registering custom implementations for those interfaces. So I go into one of those. Like anything else, it'll, um, you know, there's some methods that you're going to need to override. And the way, I, um, the way I figured this out was pretty much going and looking at the Identity Server uh, source code, which if you're thinking of using Identity Server, you should get used to doing. Uh, there's documentation out there, um, but 
more often than not, you'll go into the, uh, the source code, you'll whip out the views, for example, you'll have a look at how it does it, you might take a direct copy of it and just modify a few names of the innocent, and that's certainly what I've done in a few of the instances here. So with the user service, um, and with a few of the other services as well, the first thing I did was have a look at the source code, put it in my solution, and start to fiddle with it, run some debug points, those kinds of things. Um, Although what you have the benefit of with this solution here is all those custom elements are extracted for you. So if you were to download it and, and play with it, and you're more than welcome to, you've got all those elements there. In addition, uh, and just as a side note, if we're looking at the schema, it's kind of what it looks like. So you don't get to see it all there. Um, but in this uh, solution here, there's a, a set of uh, DDL data, uh, database scripts as well as data scripts um, that will populate this schema for you and throw some, um, some basic uh, users and clients and scopes in there as well. So you don't have to kind of um, rely on the entity framework, run it, see what the tables are, create your own DDL scripts. This is all actually done there for you. So I did a bit of reverse engineering just to figure that out. Um, so coming back to the services though, so I'm implementing um, our user service and we've got authenticate local async. It's calling my membership service here and authenticating a user, so that's going against the database. And we're using my spectacular Dapper repo. And there's nothing special about this uh, Dapper repo. There are some methods on here like get client and this isn't a particular interface, it's just how I've implemented it. Uh, it's not the most uh, efficient but it's, it works. Um, and so I'm just using Dapper to go to the table. I'm doing a, you know, a select from staff from auth clients where client ID is a particular client ID. And there's things like get token, uh, delete token by key, etc. So just your basic sort of um, repository methods. And um, just looking in users at the moment, because I've pre-populated this, it's just I've got Freddy Krueger in there, Freddy at test.com. His password happens to be password, just in case you're wondering. And I've got no, oh, let's delete that. So I've got a user, I've got no tokens in there at the moment. So I know I'm kind of flying through this at the moment, but looking in here, my Diddy server, my custom server, these are all the custom services that you can see defined. Obviously it's going to take me a bit of time to go into each one uh, in detail. But it, I mean, it's just an interface. You implement some methods on the interface. It's pretty easy. The important point is, go back to here, how you register those guys. And here, again, you're just using identity service registration system. So you're creating a new registration association, associating the interface to your concrete implementation. So let's have a look at it in action just to make sure it is actually working. And what I will do, this time I'll actually do the authorization code flow so you can see it in action. I'll spin this up. Actually this time I'll go into Chrome. Wait for that to spin up. Chug, 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 chug. Come on. All right. So what I'm going to do here, let's see if we can zoom in on that a bit. I'm calling, oh, well, let's go back a bit. So if you can see that, I'm calling my identity server, the connect.authorize endpoint, supplying a client ID of client two the scope is offline access, uh, and so this is all defined in the database. I'll show you that in a second. Um, the response, I'll come back here. Oh. Response type of code and a redirect URI, and you can't see that still. Oh, come on. Trust me, the URI, redirect URI is localhost 5000 forward slash callback. So when you go with the authorization code flow, you need to supply a valid client ID, which is registered for authorization code flow, which you saw in the hard-coded instance initially. Um, and you need to obviously to supply a valid scope, um, and as well as a redirect URI. So when that's registered in identity server, and you're going through this authorization code flow, 
and goes, hey, all right, you've got a client ID of XYZ. I'm going to go and look that up and make sure that the redirect URI you specified is exactly the same as what's uh, registered for this application. So if I have a look in the database, uh, client redirect URIs. Uh, you can see here, obviously, we've got an ID that associates with a particular client, but we've got some um, redirect URIs there. So then it's gonna, what's going to happen is, once it gets that request, uh, it's going to ask us, identity says it's going to say, hey, all right, I've, I've recognised this, um, so let's, let's go and ask for authorization, but we've got no user logged in yet, so it wants a user to log in, which will authenticate against your particular user store. And then it'll present up a permission screen saying, all right, this application wants to access scope XYZ data on your behalf. Are you sure you want to allow this? And if you click yes, it'll go back to that client redirect URI, providing an authorization code. At that point, which would be, say, the application that you've registered, we'll take that authorization code, call back into Identity Server and say, oh, I want an access token. And then ideally, that'll, an access token will come back. And based on the scope, you may get a refresh token as well. Does all that make sense so far? Sort of. Pretty early on, no. To make that um, happen though, and to make that a little bit easier to test, um, what I've also got in this solution is a little uh, test application. It's one of the things um, that's a little bit tricky to test uh, is that flow. So you can call in with an authorization code flow, but when it does the callback, unless you've got set, something set up to accept that callback, nothing's going to happen. So you know it gets, gets part of the flow, but you don't really know what's going on. So I found it really handy. I just created a, a little console application that enables me to configure up a listener at a certain callback. And once it gets an authorization code, it will call back into Identity Server uh, and do the flow for me and just log everything so that I know stuff is working. So I found that uh, quite easy. And again, this is a, a part of this, this code. Will, you'll get this little test solution as well. So it's just it's pretty basic. So I'm listing on port 5000. Um, the local endpoint to listen on is callback. I'm providing the identity server endpoint, and I've pre-configured this, obviously. The client ID to use to call back in, because once I get the authorization code, I need to put um, an authorization header back on the request to go back into identity server. And we saw that with resource on flow, where we had authorization header basic base64 blob. So we're going to the client needs to do that once it gets the authorization code. So client two. And the client secret to use is secret. And so everything looks good, so I'm going to say, yeah, that's correct, and it starts listening. So now that I have that, I'm going to start to, I'm going to finally send off this request. And with any luck, something will happen. Right. So we've hit identity server. It's saying, all right, I've recognized the, okay, I've got 10 minutes, so I'll make this quick. I've recognised that there's a valid client ID with a valid redirect URI, so I need you to, uh, to prove who you are. So in this case, we've got Freddy. Come and pass the word. Okay, client number two would like to access your data on your behalf. And this is, again, my custom asset at the moment that it's loading. Do I want to uh, allow it? Well, I think so. Sounds pretty trustworthy to me. So I'll just put this in the background so you can see this is actually going to get the request. So once I say yes, it's going to say, all right, so uh, the user's validated this. We're going to use the callback URI to send the authorization code back to that callback. Yep. And you'll see it's spinning away over here. And it doesn't look very spectacular. Uh, but here you can see, all right, callback received, authorization code of blah, which is what this guy gave as a response. But also in the background, um, let's see if I can zoom in on that. It's, uh, what it's done here is it's uh, got the token, it's made uh, an authorization code request with that authorization code and got an access token, and then finally it's called an identity server endpoint to say, tell me about the token, what's in it, and that's what you see down here. So that little JSON blob there where it's got AUD, which is audience, uh, which is auth some site, uh, resources, uh, expiry, uh, is also home, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff with it, the client IDs in there as well. So with that in place, we know that everything's actually working fine. And what that means is we've got this whole authorization code flow working. Uh, we've got customized assets. We've got it um, reading from the database. And if I go back to the database now, and let's have a look at the tokens. 
you can see it's whacked in some tokens there. Um, and I think just to answer your question before, so we don't really store uh, the password in um, plain text. It is being hashed, not very well because it's a, it's a pretty dapper demo, but um, uh, you know you can do pretty much whatever you want to save the password away. So whatever security me mechanisms you want to wrap that around, because once when, you know with your implementation you can do anything you like in terms of storing that. So we know that it is hitting the database. It's easy enough to integrate to the application because now we can control where it's, where it's going. We've got customized assets. We've just seen that the authorization to code flow working. So you know we're done, right? So all that from Coming back here, a little bit of configuration. Coming back down here, we're building on our customized assets, which were pretty easy. And we've got some more configuration to set up our customized implementations. And going down to, the, let's go into here for example. So obviously, um, there's a lot more work to getting those custom implementations coded up, but to actually make it work and to call into the places that you need to, um, you know, it's not that hard. This is just kind of the, the plumbing and the grunt work to, to customise it to your uh, implementation. It's the configuration uh, that does all the, all the right pointing uh, and right setup for you. Now it looks pretty easy here. I have to say that during my time with it, it wasn't so easy. There were certainly some uh, pain points with it. Let's go back to the presentation. Uh, I did mention identity service supports OpenID, um, which I will show you at the end if I get time. I'll just fly through this and then we'll come back to that if that's okay with you guys. Uh, OpenID being um, it's taking care of all authentication and um, authorization for you. But uh, as I mentioned, it's not, um, you know, it seems simple. The, the, the configuration that I've shown you here is relatively easy to understand. But to get to that point, I had to bounce in between source code and look through threads. Um, of, uh, in the issue register, and some of them, you know, were fairly, some of the, the issues were similar to mine. You'd read down the thread and there'd be uh, Dominic or Brock Allen there saying, well, just read the OAuth 2 spec. And you think, uh, 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 it's not really that interesting and I don't really, that doesn't really answer my question. And I suppose they're probably getting lots of uh, requests because everybody's got unique scenarios and this, um, you know, it's kind of like, well, just go and read the spec, you dumb shit, and waste my time with something real. Uh, so you kind of get that feel from a lot of the, the um, uh, their answers, but uh, a lot of this stuff that I've shown in here is as a result of sort of going all over, all over those issues and trying to, to get to an answer. Uh, so hopefully that will save you a, a lot of time. There are a heap of samples that come with uh, identity service. I encourage you to download all of them. Um, sometimes they can prove a little more confusing uh, at the start because there's so many ways of doing things. So in that instance, I'd take the time to just work out your use case scenarios and only concentrate on the samples that make sense to you first. Um, testing, again, was a, uh, was a bit difficult until we developed this, just this little console app that acted as kind of a buffer and I could see exactly what was going on. I had full control of it. So I know um, even though you get the authorization code and then making that subsequent call back to try and validate it, you know, um, if there's problems there, they're not immediately apparent unless you've got that test application going. So those kinds of things can really take a lot of your time. Um, so I did mention that, uh, you know, out of any takeaway uh, from this, just get logging working first and everything else will be much, much easier. Download all the samples and familiarize yourself with them. Bounce through the ones that don't. Uh, pick your use case first, but then look at the others as well to get an idea of some of the options. Um, we're looking at some of the documentation. It, it sometimes can be a bit sparse and you can be looking at some of the older documentation to just make sure you're looking at the current. I was tripped up a few times on that. Uh, and make sure you get some sort of test harness or callback uh, site to help you particularly test the authorization code flow, which has a lot of moving parts in it. Um, so that's pretty much the, uh, the end of my prezo. There's some links there. Um, feel free to download the code and use at your will. Um, I'm not sure how much time I've got. I will, if I've got a few more minutes, I will take you through the OpenID flow, uh, which is very similar in terms of configuration again, so it's not too exciting. Or I can answer some questions if anybody uh, has any questions. Yes. Where does identity server play in terms of uh, single sign-on and federation? Uh, well, it takes care of uh, issuing a secure token. So you can just, um, in terms of single sign-on, this can be completely separate to your application. It's a good candidate for, for it remaining within a particular bounded context. So long as that's your secure, trusted 
you know, a secure token service, all your other applications can use that to validate tokens and therefore they're using the same token source. So that acts as your single sign-on. Does that answer your question? So like, um, if you've got application X, application Y, application Z, um, you're accessing the same token. So when it grabs the token to validate and say, yeah, this is actually valid, um, and this uh, guy over here is also uh, uh, you know, using that to authenticate. So you're using the same user base. So in the case of the authorization code flow, for example, the same user would be authenticating. Um, so it'd use the, the same token source. Um, so it would be able to authenticate with the same user in that instance. So if you're talking just grab one token against sort of everybody, uh, so if you shared that token around and validate it against the same identity server instance, that would work exactly the same way. Yep. Any other questions? Omar. Um, the, uh, I know you have touched much of external identities here, but um, have you played around with external um, identities? And so the question... Like the, uh, identity providers like Facebook, Google, etc. Uh, the real question is, can you tie that external identity and internal user pro profile together? Can you link the identities together? So the question was, um, have I played much with external identity providers? providers and can you link those identities together? The answer is I haven't played with a lot with them. I've done the usual, you know, configure them up, see if it works and, and move on. Uh, but I believe you can link them together. Um, and the configuration is very similar, but finding the exact configuration to get it right is probably a little bit harder. Uh, but so the answer is yes, you can do it, but I haven't personally done it. Any other questions? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, in terms of uh, scalability, can you spin up a few instances of this uh, server, like for maybe for very active clients where there are like thousands of requests uh, with load balancing or something. Can you spin out like two instances? Of course you can. Yep, it's just another um, instance of a web application. Provided it's accessing the same uh, data store, then yes, absolutely. It works fine. Yep, absolutely it does. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, yes? Well, that's probably a bigger question. It depends on whether the initial implementation was uh, spec compliant, um, because a lot of people who implement OAuth 2 and be very, very close to spec compliant or have a few different nuances, and that'll be where you come unstuck. If it's definitely spec compliant, and these guys have done it to the letter, okay. painfully so. So if you've done that, then it should, it should just carry across very easily. Any more questions? Yes. So what's beyond OAuth 2? What's spinning the box? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. OAuth 2 is pretty prevalent. All the big guys are using it at the moment. moment. Um, as to what's next, uh, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm not a security yeah, guy. Stuff and yeah, I'm, too. yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure whether um, it'll be, because that's more incremental. I think there'll be something, a, a larger scale change that'll, that'll overtake this, but I'm not sure what that is. Yes? Uh, I haven't personally done it. Uh, I believe it does integrate well um, as to how hard that is. I'm not sure. That's another NuGet package that you'll uh, install and then you'll set up the configuration exactly the same way, you know, app dot, set up some options. Uh, so I believe you can do it. I personally haven't done it. So the NuGet package? I believe so, yes. Yep. I saw that mentioned in a few of the threads and there were people who had issues with it because it's the con getting the configuration right. Well, it's, you know, you see it on a screen and think, that's a piece of cake. Getting that right is the, is the difficult bit and that'll be where you'll, um, you'll, you'll spend some time. Any more questions? Yes, at the back. Have you used like, the server with single page applications? Uh, the main problem is what you recommend the flows because uh, uh, recommended flow is the implicit flow that doesn't support the re refresh tokens. So mm -hmm. There are configuration options in Identity Server to determine uh, sliding cookies, sliding tokens, whether they're ability to be um, a refresh or it's just a static time frame. Um, so you should be able to configure all that uh, to meet that need. I haven't personally done it, but I know you, I've seen the options in there. I know you can do it. Uh, so I know it's a bit of a glib answer, but um, uh, I've certainly know that you can configure it to meet that sliding expiration scenario. Yeah. 
I haven't done much with the hybrid flow, to be honest. I find that um, a little too confusing for me. I'm, I was more concentrated on the authorization code flow because I think that's, uh, that's probably the main one uh, most people use. Uh, that's basically unique for spar apps, JavaScript clients, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Can you deploy the, the identity server in the Windows server by using IIS and just always? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all you need to do is provide a host for it. Absolutely. There's no restrictions that way. It's pretty, uh, pretty flexible. Any other questions? OK, that's probably, probably about wrapping up, I think. Um, there's the obligatory uh, sponsor slide. Thank you very much for attending. I hope I haven't made it uh, too boring this early in the morning, because I know it's a bit tough. Uh, but thanks again. Uh, feel free to contact me via my email. Download the code, have a look, have a play. Shoot me some questions if you like. I'd be uh, happy to chat. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.